uh, okay. Welcome. I'm just here as a shadow moderator, so uh, this is an introduce to Lin Tan, uh, who will be reading from a manuscript, First Thing Seems. Uh, I had the privilege of reading her manuscript when uh, Kenny from Books Actually and Met the Press emailed me the manuscript. And I'm glad to say that uh, it's a very intimate, very personal, very intense book of poems, and it will be out uh, probably in April. 19th April, so do look out for that. Uh, but for today, Jolene will be reading a few poems from the manuscript. Uh, just to say a few words, uh, you know, I'm glad to you know see another book, the book that's coming out, by a female poet. And not just that, a female poet who writes about what I call real things. <laughs> Personal, you know, psychological things, you know, uh, from a very intimate perspective on life as opposed to void decks and alliance and social or whatever. You know, it's nice and refreshing to have more female poets do that uh, in the literature here. So without further ado, uh, I will have Jolie to read five poems, followed by a short Q&A session, and then you will run out with another poem. Right, Jolie. Uh, okay, hi. Um, well, okay, thanks, Cyril. <laughs> I'm friend of in Germany, but you need to know that. Um, okay, the first poem that I'm going to read, it's called Tsunami. I always read it first because it's the most, like, I wouldn't say it's the least emotionally intense, but it's not so personal. And it's about the tsunami that happened in Japan in 2011, I believe. Uh, it was like this tsunami. Yesterday, Japan became Atlantis. But we cannot turn into water people, we'll breathe with gills and live in the crystal palaces on the beds of the ocean. Fishes out of water, men in the depths, in their places. While I was asleep, countries drank a drop too much, had wine forced on their faces, and there were people all over who dissolved into oblivion. What is the measure of God's fury? The world is dying. Is that the end of that one? <laughs> and then we have um, about being beautiful, which is addressed to myself, I think. Because I had this moment where I was like, I'm having a bad body image here and I'm going to write something that makes me feel good about myself. So, being beautiful. I am beautiful not in spite of my perfections, but because of what I am. 5 feet 2 and 70 kilograms, I am not your average Barbie doll, with a perfect hourglass figure. And by the way, that should remind you that the time is running out. I am beautiful because this body holds stories that its skin tells, and every welt, every mark, every goose pimple is braille for you to run your fingers over and find out what I am made of. I am a writer, and yet when I cannot find the words for myself, my body forms a language for me, telling you things that I have forgotten. Love, do not be repulsed by what you see. Turn yourself into a blind person. Run your fingers over the dents and the rises in my skin and translate them. Read me like a book and tell me I am beautiful. Okay, and then since we read that one, right, I'm going to continue with another one that was another reminder on another bad body image day because I have a lot of those. It's called um, Reminder. If they tell you, you are so big, Fernando Rotero couldn't contain you in oil and canvas. Be proud. Say you were larger than life, too extraordinary to be appropriated into something people pretended to understand and called art. One day you will know that even if someone captured your body in an image, rendered it in paint, your spirit and your heart would melt past the boundaries and spill past the frames they used to cage you. When you feel like a mess of brilliant colours, remember then that this complexity, too much life and emotion and breath, this is what you are. Um, the fourth piece is called Denial is a River, and it's not about body image, it's about a friend who likes to pretend that things didn't happen because she runs away from things. So, Actually, Denial of the River is a joke, you guys know that, right? Because like, it sounds like that now, in Egypt. Okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's not the title of the Denial of the River. And it goes, Denial of the River, not a way to wash your hands off everything or create a new life. Not bends you retreat to withdrawing from what you know, not a stream that will bore your past away. You build, you build levees on your shores to suppress the rampant emotions, but they are leaking through anyway. You are stubborn as sedimentary rock, resting tired and heavy on the waterbed. The current is still going strong, washing over you and bringing with it everything that you cannot forget. And the last one that I'm going to read is called Old Scars Still Talk. It's about Scars you get from self harming, I suppose, for those people who self harm. Um, it goes like this Look at these mouths on my skin, they talk. I cover them with sleeves, but sometimes they are too loud. The sound waves making fabric slip to speak. This is my body, my skin with its lips, and it tells of the colors and pain in my blood, hazy memories I am afraid to break into sentences. And my words can't come right, but I know these mouths. They are born in angry red and so noisy, and even when they neutralize, quieten, and become knitted rises on my skin, they still whisper, see, see, she's an artist, she made us. And all those mouths, on people's faces, on the correct places, they talk to. Thank you. Uh, I just want to just start off the question and answer section a little bit. Uh, when you were compiling this manuscript called Bursting Seams, which club, it will be out in April. Uh, when you were compiling the manuscript and deciding what poems to that would go in, uh, was there a can you talk a bit more about the overarching themes that picked the poems? I think um, prior to sending the manuscript to Kenya, I was going through a period where um, I was struggling a lot with body image things. So I wrote a lot of poems about those. And I don't think I consciously tried to write according to a certain theme. You know, I just write according to what I wanted to write. And then they just sort of came together in the sense that when I looked at um, my poems, a lot of them, or like more than, more than not, more often than not, um, they dealt with body image and the things I felt about body image and the things I've always been someone who has very intense, excessive emotions, which is not a bad thing, but it can feel pretty terrible and it can feel like you're, like I physically cannot contain my emotions sometimes because I have very psychosomatic reactions to my emotions, like when I am nervous my stomach hurts. So I think what I put down on was a lot of um, a lot to do with the, with the body. So this this whole collection actually deals a lot with body image issues and the things that your body feels or like the emotions that I feel because I always feel like the original title was the first thing at the scene, which Cyril said was cliche, which is. <coughs> but um, as in, it made sense to me because it always felt like my emotions were kind of like bursting out of my body, and my body itself is bursting at the scene. Maybe not, but yeah, you get the drift. So a lot of it is related to excessive emotion and excess as a person, like physical excess itself, and how I deal with that. So those are the things that I suppose. Okay, that's something very, very important to stress, I feel, because I think as poets, I think as the kind of poets that we are, uh, I, I think we share that in the sense that we there is ultimately a sense of shame, not not because of not because it's our fault, but because we live in a society that would encourage us to feel shameful about certain things, you know, uh, feel shame about expressing ourselves in certain ways, the things you cannot say on the page, the things you cannot feel, you cannot believe by yourself. So it's always a constant struggle. I mean, especially in Singapore. I think. Uh, what do you hope to achieve in this book? Mm -hmm. And then following that, if you have a second book after this, what will be the development of this book? Yeah. What do I hope to achieve? Um, I hope to achieve that people can read your book after it comes out. What do you want them to feel? Yeah. I think I want them to feel like they're not alone. Like, I think that's the most important thing. 
I just, um, I think, well, what do I want it to achieve? If I encounter a reader who has read my book and doesn't know me, I guess the best thing that I could hear from him or her would be to say that they identify. Because in the, the, I struggle a lot, and a lot of my friends have told me, I like, know, every girl has got you make shoes. And I know, but they're unique. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'm not discounting that, I'm sorry. No offense intended. Um, but I believe that your experiences are unique, but the <coughs> fundamental nature of those feelings and where they stem from are the same. So, I wasn't really thinking of um, what I wanted to achieve when I wrote this book, but I know that, um, I do hope that that um, people feel the sincerity and how real and honest my poems are, because I don't exactly hide anything when I write that wouldn't be very honest, and I like honesty. Yeah, so I guess to, that's to answer your, question, your first question. And the second question was about what I hope my next collection to be. This going to sound very shameless, I've already sent it to Kenny. Yeah! Okay, Yeah, but um, my second collection is Compound. <coughs> I suppose that's an extension of my emotions because a lot of my life revolves around my my religion, my Christianity, and my faith with regards to it, and just normal general faith in everyday life, you know, faith and hope kind of thing. So it's an extension of those emotions. Like I think those are the ones that I'm most afraid to feel because when you feel like you're putting faith in something other than yourself or you're hoping for something, it feels like you're not in control, and I'm obsessive with control. So. Um, a lot of my emotions stem from not trusting people or not trusting myself. That's why I think we should deal a lot with faith, how to put your faith, where to put it, or where it may pop up in your life. You know, it's, yeah. Let's jump in. Okay. Thank you. That's, right. That's actually very, very good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Uh, I think readers, I think when readers when they encounter your poetry, when you actually meet them, trust me, they will ask these things. And sometimes they will even ask more probing questions, you know, like, why do you write on such things? Why is it so painful? It's like, isn't there hope at the end of the tunnel? <laughs> like, you, know, you, know, you encounter a whole spectrum of sometimes intelligence to stupid questions. <laughs> like, you just have to suck it up and, you know, yeah. answer them. Yeah. So, well, the journey is long, you've just begun. <laughs> Does anyone here have any questions before I let her? Yeah. Yes, I have a question. I'm Robin from the National Grid's Choice Online News and Television. Uh, my question for you as uh, to the author right now is that have you found strength and solace uh, after you have written uh, the poetry? And also have you found uh, your self-esteem uh, being restructured as, a, as more of self-confidence in you right now? Have you found that? That now that you're able to love yourself? And what is beauty to you now today? The definition of beauty. Okay, that is definitely a process. I have not completely reconstructed my self esteem, but it is there, and I'm working on it. Um, writing does give you strength, or it gives me strength in the way um, when you write something, there's a lot of construction that goes into poetry because you can't just write something like. Some people write a lot of empty words and they don't mean anything and they call it poetry, but there's a lot more to it. And I say that as a student studying literature. Because when you write poetry, every word and every line is purposeful and it means something. So in that way, when I write, um, I do draw strength from it because I understand my struggles better and where they come from and how to better deal with them in that sense. So there's a more concrete way to go about um, sort of like building it up again if I break down. So that's, yeah. And what does beauty mean to me now? That's a hard question because we grew up in a society where beauty is like, oh, size zero, big eyes, nice boobs, kind of thing. And it's very hard to shake that onto a lot of it because that's what we've been taught since young. I'm going to come on and what kind of gift do you give to a girl on the first birthday, Bobby Joel? Right? So that's the ideal notion of beauty. And it's very hard to shake it, but definitely beauty to me now means a lot more than that. And it's about who you are as a person in the gym, like whether or not. Um, like it really depends on your outlook on the world and what kind of person you are, the shape of your thoughts, how you think and how you express yourself. 
But do you think do you, do you think poet is beauty? I wouldn't say that it's confined to that. Mm-hmm. I definitely find confidence in my identification as a writer or someone who writes poetry. Mm-hmm. But I don't necessarily think that um, that's an absolute definition that you can give. Words are beautiful, yes. And to have words is a blessing and it's a very beautiful thing. But um, not all words are beautiful people. And not all beautiful people are poets. They are being, like, it's not mutually inclusive, like the idea of a poet and beauty. Yeah. Plenty of poets are really not beautiful. But very beautiful things. I've met them. Uh, <clears throat> but does your faith as well, I mean, I'm sure there's also another interesting, not interesting, that's a very trivial way of saying it. It's a very important aspect of you, you know. Does that your faith contribute to your ideas of beauty now in, in the way you express the different words you know, and talking about yourself and all that? I think definitely, I mean, because when you talk about um, my idea of beauty, some of it entails being complete as a person. And my personal faith and religion and belief is that um, I want to be somebody who's complete in God. Like as a Christian, and that definitely is beauty because it's beautiful and the kind of peace that you can experience when you're there. I mean, I've had it before, but very briefly, and I want it back. So it's definitely like my faith and my notion of beauty are very closely associated. Of course, I have bad irrational beliefs where I'm just like, no, I must be sad to be beautiful. But then those days pass. Yeah. Okay. I mean, like you said, like, it's a process. It's a process. Does anyone have any other questions? I think it's very difficult for I mean, a, a poor like you, uh, or poor like me too, I mean, uh, because we, we write about such personal things, I mean, we end up putting our heart out there on the page. And when you ask us questions, they are ultimately personal questions, whether you, you like it or not. Because the poetry is about us, right? So it becomes a very Oprah Winfrey kind of moment, yeah. you know, when you ask us things like that. We cannot help but answer it in a very intimate way. So, feel free to ask. <laughs> I have one other question that yeah, is sure. what's your favorite moment in writing your poets? You know, um, is there one poet that you found? I know you have lots of poets that's that's really or me. Uh, the, uh, well, let me rephrase my question again. My my question is is that what what is when is what is your favorite, favorite moment in writing your poetry? You know, because you gather all your inspiration, and of course you have written many poetries. Uh, to compile in one book, and would, would there be one poetry that they, that is closest to your heart that you like to tell us Here, I'll about? Here, I'll talk about my favorite piece. Yes. Uh, okay, so you're something else. I mean, too, right? Okay, so like, answer the whole, like, what's my favorite <laughs> moment in writing poetry. In general, um, it feels best when you finally finish editing the poem, because it's a terrible process. It feels like you're cutting off your fingers and trying to sew them back on because like, you don't know which part should stick, which part don't, and every line feels like a child. Um, yeah, so when you finish editing it, um, for me, some of the times, it just feels finished, you know? So you look at it and you're like, yeah, I like this. So that's nice. As for my favorite piece, um, I have a lot, actually. I, it's very hard to choose, like, choosing a favorite child. Um, I think I like um, about being beautiful best because it's it's honest and yeah, I didn't do any of the whole um, extending imagery thing, which always makes it feel a bit more distant. It's like oh, I can look at this through an image, therefore it's not so painful to write about. But about being beautiful was very hard because um, I don't I don't think I'm beautiful all the time. Like my friends are like oh, but you're beautiful. I'm like no, <laughs> but thanks. <laughs> Since you know, it's not something that you personally went through, it's a scenario. 
and you know if if they actually go through it, then it's actually very about it. It almost seems like it's just a creative exercise in the for you. And like it might even get like trivializing the actual victims experiences. Right, okay. Um and you're not claiming to be able to represent any of the victims when through the tsunami. So I understand your point about trivializing. It is true, it might be a bit reductive if I claim that it was a whole like a whole serious representation of my experience, but it's not. And um I don't I do creative exercises, but very, very reluctantly. Like if someone tells me to write a certain thing according to the guidelines, I'm just like, mm-hmm. writing has become natural. Then like most of the time, I just don't do it, you know. Um, tsunami happened when I was watching the news. I believe it was the day after the tsunami happened, and I was in my dad's room watching the news on the TV, and it kind of just came to me, cause actually I don't know why. Yeah, so I just wrote it on my phone. I really don't know why I wrote it. As in, it just felt right to write it. Because they were talking about the tsunami and how, like, in a moment, Japan became basically a mess of debris. And it just, I just felt like I wanted to write something dedicated to it, but not representing it. I think you're talking about compassion too. I mean, when you see someone else suffer, you feel it too. I mean, yeah, I mean, it makes you a human being, it makes you a good person. Not everyone has this. <laughs> Not all human beings are good people, sorry, you know. Thank you. Yeah, you know, so, if you feel that sense of compassion, you, you see someone else suffering. Or to put it another way, put it in a more academic way, for example, you know. I think poetry is about bearing witness, it's about, you know, making testimonies. And the same argument was made about, you know, the Holocaust, about 911. Like, how dare you write about the Holocaust? You're not Jewish, you're not, you didn't go through it. But then if no one else, if no one does it, it will be forgotten. It's a record. It's an emotional record. All records are imperfect, but it's still a record. It's a human record, you know. It's like, and sometimes poetry can be one of the best ways of very witness to pain, uh, universal human pain. You know? Of course, there is a risk. It's true, there is a risk of trivializing. But it's a risk, I think, you and I are willing to take. It's a risk. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just add that yeah. like, in writing the poem, I acknowledge that I was distant from the situation and attempting to contain something that couldn't really... Yeah, because if you look at the visual form, which you can, once the poem is out, it's seven syllables line in two centers. So that's pretty contained, I think. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? <coughs> no? No questions? Can you want to say anything before Jodie reads her last poem? Okay, okay um, the, act, the actual problem of her books are uh, both with Jodie and of course these things. Um, they had the books on 19th of April. It was actually on 19th of April. I think it just helps if everyone joins the Books Actually Facebook group. Page, page, page. Page, sorry, page. page. Facebook page. And then all the events will be there and you'll be updated, you know, Books Actually. So, 19th April, so just put that date somewhere in your subconscious. <laughs> so, if there are no more questions, yeah? Julie will read the last book. Okay. My last book is called My Belly. Think about my belly. <laughs> I don't think it's train, like MRT train, so you will never know. My belly is a flower pot. I sit here, craving it between my arms, and it nestles in the crooks of my elbows. But I don't like the way the flower looks distended and bulging. It's too big. I could wrap it up or cut a slit and drain the extra set from it, but that would be cheating. They tell me to take the flower pot and run until the head, too heavy, drops off. Petal by red petal. Still every day, I water this flower and I can't stop.
Sky Dance in the Journey Review Collection. And so we'll be our moderator for today, so we'll be doing the QA and um, any questions, basic questions or anything. We're going to drag more hype now that this thing reviews itself and so we'll do some introduction. Uh, thank you for coming. On behalf of uh, you know, both actually math, uh, math paper press and uh, arts house, thank you for being here. Uh, as Kenny was saying, Kenny is the book's uh, actually uh, owner, publisher, many hyphenates. Uh, uh, this is uh, Kali Sin's uh, first book of poems. It will be out on the 19th of April. Uh, today she'll be reading from sections of the book. Uh, the book is called uh, Keeping Skeletons. I think as a kind of a short introduction, a very vague one in a way. I mean, uh, I think I'll say just now during Jolene Tan's poetry uh, reading that there is uh, a dearth of uh, female poets in Singapore. Uh, a dearth of female poets writing about certain themes more personal themes, more introspective themes. And it's very, uh, it's wonderful that someone like uh, you know, Kenny uh, from books actually and Math Paper Press is trying to push out a lot of younger female voices in poetry. So please do, uh, when we have another book launch for Lee and for Jolie Tan on the 19th of April, please come to books actually to, to support them. So for today's uh, session, uh, Isim will be reading her poems and I hope you can also introduce like, uh, the themes of your book and the structure of your poems. Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, so I'll be reading from Keeping Then we could 
yourselves. You held a dog and ran a toy car over my skin, and I had wished that would erase the cells which wrote my name. I think this poem is more um, applicable to children and as in girls who wish to be boys and boys who wish to be girls. So, um, society usually define these boundaries and say that okay, girls cannot play with toy cars or like boys cannot play with bum dogs. And I don't think that I don't think that should stop them from doing what makes them happy. So I I wrote this I mean, I wrote this, I felt a bit sad because as in, when you were born, you are already, you are already confined by these societal boundaries. And so I hope that this poem will encourage people to just break out of these boundaries and do what they hope, what they wish to do. Yeah. And then, okay, I'll, I'll move on to section two, which is skin. So the skin is the surface of the body. And um, so the points of these sections are, uh, about things that are examined at a very superficial level or like not given enough thought. So the point that I picked from this section is called Indelible Movement and my friend Grisha here, yeah, she was the one who gave me the title for this word. So thank you. Okay, so uh, Indelible Movement. 4 p.m. The subway station. Her needle twirls the yarn around and a man stares at the muscle that flex and gives life to the face inch on his skin. It's a very, very short poem and I wrote it when I was in the train because um, I saw I saw this lady um, knitting something and she had a lot of tattoos on her skin and then um, I saw this man staring at her very curiously like as though someone with tattoos shouldn't be knitting so I thought that it's also about societal boundaries and societal expectations and how you uh, how if you behave in a sort of way or like you have tattoos something like that you shouldn't be doing something that goes against that image that you have portrayed so I, I just think it's ridiculous and thus I wrote this poem. Yeah. Okay, and then the skin section is very short, so I'll, I'll move on to the next section. Um, the next section is the brain. Uh, it is where the memories are kept. And so the poems in these sections are mostly about uh, memories and remembering something and using words to keep a memory alive. Okay, um, okay so this poem is uh, When You Are Dead. It's a bit more late, sorry. Okay, so I will keep a fire alive to wait for the return of your ghost. Please let it wander, let it whisper my name, let it share my reflection, and let it listen to the hollow song in my chest. Uh, I wrote this because I think it's very sad that people die, people, people die in their lives, and uh, so I wrote this to remember the people who have left my life and sometimes I do wish that they'll, they'll come back but it's not possible so only words can be them back. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for those of you who just come in, those poems that you've uh, the poem that you've heard is from her uh, manuscript keeping skeletons, uh, which will be out on 19th April at books actually. So please do take note of that. Uh, now for uh, the Q&A section, I just wanted to just start off by asking, uh, you divided your book into sections, right? Uh, what do you hope to uh, gain from sectioning your poems like that? When the reader enters your poems like, for the first time, this is your first book, so this is a very, very uh, big question for you, right? You know, because you never know what you're going to expect when you publish the book, but secretly, you know, deep inside yourself, what do you hope for readers to take away when you read be opposed to those sections. Uh, I split them into like sections so that the reader can focus on that one thing that I try to explore with those poems. Like for example, um, the brain, yeah, it's, it's like about the memories. So those poems must be about the memories. And so when they have finished reading the book, they'll have a very clear idea of oh, okay, she has she has these different themes in so it's, the themes are very clear to the person so they won't feel like oh what are you talking about but all these poems they all link back to the same idea about keeping something that will be lost eventually I mean your identity will one day might they might be taken away from you anyway and your memories too so yeah they all link to the same thing but they explore a different idea to go back to that keeping something that will be lost. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I sense that uh, in your poems there is a fear, I think, a fear of losing, uh, losing many things, losing something more abstract, like say a sense of self, an identity, but also a very literal form of losing, which is death, yeah. death and all that. Um, can I just ask you, I mean, I think I was saying this one in the earlier reading, as poets, when we talk about our poetry, we cannot help but talk about ourselves because it's so much, it's, it's our feelings and our soul and our heart all in one on our page, right? So, why do these concerns uh, matter so much to you? I mean, I'm sure these will be revealed in your poems, but if you can sum it up in a way, why do these things haunt you so much? I mean, your book called Keeping Skeletons, you're keeping something in there, right? So, what, why do these skeletons have such an impression? Um, firstly, to me, identity is very important and I don't like it when someone trying to change who I am or try to shape my identity. So these poems are in response to those people who try to change someone else's identity. And um, about losing somebody, I don't think there's any way to keep somebody by your side forever. So the only way to remember them forever is by words. Yeah, and so it's, I'm just very scared of losing people. So yeah, so it's my only way of trying to remember the times that I've spent with these people. I mean, but does writing about you know letting go of people help you to, in a very real sense, you know, let go, you know, to move on from you know death, which is always an adventure. You know, in these poems when you write about loss, about departures. Or losing a sense of self does it help you in any way? Does it make does it make you stronger? You know? Okay, I guess when I write about them, I'll just feel more comforted. Like right? I'll just know that I'll always have these words to help me to cope with these issues. Yeah, it's my way of of expressing myself, even if no one wants to listen to me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? What time is it? Yes, I have a question for you. You said uh, that you hate to lose your identity, and you also mentioned that identity is important to you. Uh, could you describe to us what is identity uh, defined, and what is a Singaporean identity as a Singaporean yourself? Does being a, is your sense of identity tied to being Singaporean at all? Come to, the, my, to my next question. That is, how did you overcome fear from losing your identity and, and also having someone else to rob of your identity? Does anyone try to rob you of your identity? Maybe not. Feel free to share. <laughs> Right, poetry. Why? Always something, right? So, uh, 
do these things that appear not in the poetry, this kind of defense mechanism against these people will tell you that you, should, you must be this, you cannot be that, you know? Yeah, uh, okay. How do you get Okay, the business student part, right? Um, where I was, because I'm, I'm, I'm studying accountancy, okay, for those who don't know that, and, and um, a lot of people in my school will be like, what? You write poems? And then, and then they don't believe that I can write. And then, um, so uh, the, the voice in those poems will it, it, it just address all these, all these, like, it's these things that they impose on you. Like, if you're a accountancy student, you can't be writing. It's just, it just doesn't match. And, and then, um, uh, and, and like for example in Bone Days, this is the other poem that I have not shared, it's, uh, it's I will always talk about how um I will I'll mention, I'll say something like, oh people try to uh, uh make me do something else that I that, that they think is fitting of my image. And then um but then I will say something else like uh I I will do what you want me to do, but then inside I will not change for you. It's I'm still that person inside me, even if I do that on the Anyone else have any questions? Um, where did you get inspiration from? I think all these terms. Inspiration. Okay, um, um, inspiration. Everything is in, when I see oh, something. You are. The people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, in the past it was mostly people who pissed me off. Now it's just like things that, like, <laughs> things that it's just. the truth. It's all about the truth. Come here, you're It's all about. Yeah. Now it's just more like uh, if I see something that I think should be addressed, then I will talk about it and I don't really care if I someone I think. Like for example I'll talk about education in Singapore and then I'll talk about why it's why it, it, it stifles creativity and stuff like that. It's just issues that I feel should be addressed and I don't really see people addressing them. Yes. I wonder what uh what role do you think the arts will play in Singapore over the next 20, 30 years to kind of put and give voice to some of the sentiments that are being expressed here today? Do you have a hope for the future for the arts about what role it plays in Singapore society? Uh, Maybe not 20 years, 10 years? <laughs> Who's the exception of the norm? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who's willing to give people a chance? So thank you, Kenny. <laughs> and yeah, and um, I feel I feel that uh, young Singaporeans are more and more open to um, things that are outside of the norm. So I guess I'm quite hopeful. And so I. So we say that the arts like, will continue to provide an avenue for an alternative voice. I think so. I think yeah. I'm sure there are more people like me outside who. Yeah. So, yeah. I think it's a very complicated issue because it's not just a division between arts and society. I think there's a lot of uh, things that hold these things together, which are all very interconnected. There, are, there is government agencies, there's the education system, there's the media, and then the population keeps changing. The kind of Singaporean identity always changes every 10 years. So all these things, uh, I think, make us rethink what is the arts, right? But I think what Lee Sin is trying to say and expressing through the whole is that you know, in Singapore right now, and I suspect this will be the same you know, 10 or 20 years from now, it will always be a struggle uh, in the sense of uh, artistic expression versus you know, capitalist feminism. You know, there will always be that tension. Uh, what is the place of the arts for that? Uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think about that? I mean, there's, but you obviously feel passionately about this, you know, yeah. being a poet, and then you feel the tension very, very personally as a business student. You know, you you, you suffer all these things all the time. A lot of poets tend to just withdraw, you know, from the public sphere and just to write or or not just both dancers, artists, you know, that. What what what? How, how do you see yourself resolving that? It's just about being um, brave. Okay, it sounds silly, but it's just about being courageous. <laughs> it's just about being courageous and um, standing up for what you really believe in. And 
don't give up even if someone tells you that like the place or uh, arts has no place in Singapore because I do I really believe that this will change eventually even if it takes like a few years like you yeah and anyway, right now you know just to add to that uh, I think the because Singapore is such a pragmatic practical place arts will always have a place you know in Singapore and to put it in a very cynical way you know arts will always have a place because it adds to the culture of Singapore it makes Singapore more sustainable some arts in the same way is like, on the same level as F1 Grand Prix as Botanical Gardens Gardens by the Bay it's, it's just on that same level so there's no real emotional to you know investment in the what is the arts really think like that. So so for better or worse there will always be support. You know so what do you think of that? I might be too simple. Uh, no, I agree with you. I guess like Singapore is very commercial. So they only uh, and they only accept stuff that is commercial and can sell. Yeah. Sorry, uh, is, is curiosity, uh, intellectual curiosity important to you? Because you've been writing poetry for quite a while now uh, in order to make this materialize. And do you think uh, the title, Keeping Skeletons, is appropriate you know, to your identity? And why do you call Keeping Skeletons? Are you, are you obsessed with skeletons? How about into, uh, uh, you know, uh, intellectual curiosity? Is it important to you? Uh, yes, definitely. Because um, I say you have to be intellectual. I you have to be. I think you. I think you have it naturally if you want to write poetry. You know, yeah. else there will be nothing will flow out. If there yeah, is no sense of curiosity about the world. You know, yeah, about you ideas. To. About Theories, philosophies. I mean, you have a philosophy about oh. how you want to live meaningfully, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's definitely important to me. As I, as if I, I feel that if I, I, do, I don't have that curiosity, then I wouldn't even care about what, what is hap what, what's happening around me. Yeah. So it's, it's all these things that happen around me that make me right. So I definitely have to have that, that, that interest and that curiosity. So, oh, just the last question. What would be the three points? Uh, to encourage Singaporeans and Asians at large on how to develop uh, the interest in poetry and writing, uh, the way you write?
as in cause I saw I saw old people and then I saw I saw that my mom has aged and I felt very sad. So yeah, so this with this photo is basically about um trying to it's just like the whole theme, it's just about trying to keep something that will eventually be lost. So words is the only thing that can keep them alive. And um the, I also draw inspiration from a, a autobiography that I read. It's about um as in the, the writer is writing about her past in the past and and I, and I thought it was amazing that these words can make these characters seem like they're still alive and like um and still very young like children. So yeah, so this poem is basically just about something that will be lost eventually. Words is the only things that keep things alive. The only, I, yeah. This is a great summary you know, of what makes you a poet, isn't it? Like you, you write to keep things alive, whether it's a memory, an identity, yeah. who you are. So with that, you know, uh, I would conclude by saying uh, Tan Yixin's book is called Keeping Skeletons. Uh, I think I've stuffed out what her book in a way, what her books are about, which are all very rich, very personal, very urgent, very fearful, but in a very, very moving way. So please do look out for her book. It should be on sale in books actually on the 19th of April. Uh, if you want to get updates about books actually readings, please go on the Facebook page. Just look for books actually and just join the page. And then there will be an event uh, page drawn up for Tan uh, Sin and then you will know when the reading is going to happen. And you'll get very non-intrusive reminders about it. Yeah? Of children in the cave. Your words, memories of skeletons in the ground. The people in your stories are dead. But beauty stands before me without blood or song, and in my mind I have pictures I have never seen. I see the age in everyone, and I feel a fear. So teach me how to twist the hands of time and keep what will be lost. <laughs>